Well, hello. Welcome to uh, the 128 course, Mental Health, Psychiatric Nursing. It also has a little geriatrics in there also. Uh, we'll be starting school in about two weeks. I apologize for my low-tech setup here, but it's the best I can do, as most of you know that I'm not too good at uh, that computer. Before we go into the first lecture, let's just um, look at the course outline. Again, I'm going to review parts of it. I expect you guys to read it either on the computer or print it and then read it, but we'll look at a couple of highlights. So here's what it looks like right here, course outline. Okay. There will be three exams. Each exam ha has 50 questions. Uh, the total exam grade equals 75% of your final grade. Your test average must uh, achieve a 74.5 before any other points are added on. I think you guys are familiar with that, okay? And I urge you, please, if you're having difficulty during the semester learning this, please come to me. I think most of you know that I love to teach. I love mental health. Um, I like explaining things, so please don't be shy. Please come and see me. Um, in addition to that, that, those three exams, there'll also be a, um, a, a V-SIMS. There'll be several V-SIMS we have to do worth 5% of your grade. Uh, also prep you worth 5% of your grade. There'll be a clinical interview. Uh, you'll have to interview a, a patient there at the hospital. We'll worry about that when we get to clinical. That's actually a very easy assignment. So now I'm going to, that was page two. Now I'm going to skip over to page four. Okay, here is page four. Okay, that's what it looks like. As you know, you must buy ATI and Prep U. You must buy it through the company, the ATI company and the Prep U company. Um, I know these items are a little expensive. But if you spend, you know, an extra six or seven hundred dollars to make it through nursing school, and now your salary goes up from twenty-five thousand a year to fifty-five thousand a year, that's a pretty good investment, right? Okay. The book. Let me get the book. The author of the book is Sheila Vedebeck. I'm going to get a copy of it. Hold on one second. Here is the old edition. That's what it looks like. It doesn't really matter what edition you use. Again, I, my, one of my jokes is Freud has been dead for about 90 years, so uh, not that much has changed. Actually, over the last um, 40 or 50 years, medications have come in that have really revolutionized the treatment of mental health. These medications truly, truly work. In clinical, you will see patients that come in floridly psychotic, hallucinating, or they're in a manic phase where they believe that they're Jesus Christ or President of the United States, and with the medication, they settle down to be able to have a, a, a regular conversation. Some of them get so well, they could actually go work a regular job, and provided they take their meds, no one in the community or at their job would ever know that they had a major mental health disorder. That's how effective the medicines are. Okay, so really the changes of the last 50 years have been medications. Freud, we'll talk about in a little bit. We'll get to him. Okay, so we spoke about ATI, Vetebeck book. Now I'm going to skip over to page six. Okay. Again, I think I this is a bit of a repeat. This is what page six looks like right there. Uh, three multiple choice, 50 questions test. You must achieve a 74.5. I have my tests uh, in the back of this. They're, the reading schedule and test schedule is in this. If any of these days conflict with any of your religious holidays, please let me know. I am flexible. My goal, our goal, I should say, of all the instructors here and professors here, is to make you the best nurse we possibly can. For all of humanity, but in reality, you'll be taking care of us probably in 20 years, and I'll be proud of that. And I've already been taking care of nurses that have been my graduates, and they do a great job. Okay. If you have any uh, disabilities, you need to show me a sheet uh, that gives you extra time on the test. Okay. Uh, this is page seven. Again, I've skipped over to page seven. Academic integrity, we expect you to be honest. 
nursing is the most respected profession in the United States, if not the world. We are considered honest people, and we want to keep it that way. A little after 9-11, firemen surpassed us in, in, the, in the esteem for professions, but over time, nurses have come back. So nurses are respected in the community, and we want to maintain that. We maintain that through academic integrity, through honesty, and I want to add here, we don't get into conspiracy theories. And I'm going to say something else. If you don't believe in science, then you probably shouldn't be a nurse. And I'm going to add another thing here. If you believe in conspiracy theories, I probably can't change your mind. But I will insist, beyond insist, that you never mention any of those conspiracy theories to patients in the hospital. These patients are vulnerable. They're already delusional. All they need is you, a respected nurse, is to put a seed in their head that a conspiracy theory is real, and I will not tolerate that, okay? And I, we, we, because these people are ill, and you have the power to get them well. So I urge you, if you don't believe in science, do not become a nurse. On page eight, their second paragraph or third paragraph down, late submission of assignments. I expect assignments to be submitted when they're due. If you're having difficulty, you can contact me. And again, I'm not here. We're not here to run you out of nursing school. But we need due dates. And I can tell you one thing. If you hand all your work in the last day of class, I'm going to be cranky. because That means I have like one day to grade all your work and get my grade or your grade into the computer so you can take the next class. So please, the dates that I give you, really try to stick with. Okay. Well, now we're on page nine. This is ATI. ATI, uh, as you, I believe you, you've taken these exams before. There's a practice test B for mental health. You'll take that exam. You'll get one percent uh, just for taking that that test, test practice test B on ATI. You get one point on your grade, one percent. Whatever you get wrong in that ATI exam, you will remediate by doing templates. Again, I think you're familiar with this. Just by doing that, you get another point added. So these are gifts we're giving you. But again, you have to achieve a 74.5 on the exams for these points to be added. Then you'll take a proctored ATI assessment, in this case in mental health. You can get anywhere from level three, uh, level two, level one, or less than level one. Let's just talk about level three. If you get level three on the mental health ATI exam, that means that you would pass the mental health part of the nursing boards right now. You haven't even studied for the board yet. If you get level two, you would probably pass the mental health part of the boards. If you got level one, you might. If you got less than level one, you probably would. So if you get level three, you get 2%, two points given to you. If you get level two, you get 1.5 points given to you. If you get level one, you get half a point given to you. If you get less than level one, you get zero points given to you. We have a recipe here. Professor Thornton and the others, I'm new to this campus, as some of you know, uh, have, have a recipe. If you go by what we require and do it rigorously and honestly, you will pass the board. We have a very, 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 very high pass rate on the boards which shows the students, you guys are doing your work, okay? Once you take that ATI proctored uh, uh, assessment, then you'll have to do remediation hours. If you got level three, you do one hour. Level two, you do two hours. Level one, you do three hours. Less than level one, you do four hours. And I will need you guys to print something to prove to me that you did it. I'm not going to go on the computer and, and dig out and search. I'm going to make you guys print something, some proof, that you did these re remediation hours. You can just you can bring it to class or you can email it to me. Okay, now the next page, this is page 10. This is, uh, in this class, we do a management um, ATI exam also. You'll take ATI management test B. You'll get one point, just like the mental health. You'll do remediation templates, you'll get one point. You'll do the profit assessment. Again, level three, you get two points. Level two, you get 1.5 points. I'll let you read that so I don't go on and on here. But it's the same thing as the mental health. 
Okay. The next page, my page 11, is the nursing, uh, is, is the interview that you will conduct with a patient. This is very simple. Basically, it's just sitting with a patient and asking them some questions. And again, we're going to review that in clinical. And I do want to say that most students come in here with a little bit of nervousness going into mental health. It is very safe. You are probably safer here on a mental health unit than you are on the Long Island Expressway because we don't know who, who is dangerous on the Long Island Expressway when they're driving. We do know who has the potential for violence in the hospital. The staff is very aware there's a lot of manpower or woman power around to handle such situations. And we'll talk about it again that in clinical, okay? So if you guys are nervous or a little anxious, that's perfectly normal. In fact, I am happy that you're a little anxious, not that I want you to suffer, but if you didn't have a little anxiety going into a situation that you're not familiar with, that means that you're overconfident. And if you're overconfident, you could make a mistake. And guess who would get blamed for that mistake? Along with you, it would be me. So once again, if you have questions, just ask. I'm available all through day of clinical. You'll see me coming in and out of the unit and you can talk to me anytime, okay? Page 12 is a rubric for that interview you're going to do. Page 13 is the B-SIMS. You have to do one, two, three, four, five case scenarios. Um, you're probably familiar with V-SIMS. Okay, you have to do, um, let's see here, you have to do a quiz, documentation, guided reflection. Okay, you'll get points for that too. You have to do prep U, which you're uh, familiar with also. Okay more about that. At the end of this clinical, this five-week rotation, you will be, I will evaluate you clinically uh, and we'll review how you did. I want to make clear, if I don't, I would not spring on you that you're failing clinical. That would be unprofessional of me. And also, if you're working in a hospital or a facility and they spring on you that you're getting a bad annual evaluation, that's not really fair. A couple of months before that formal evaluation, the head nurse should sit down with you and say, look, you have some deficiencies here. Here they are, and here's how you can correct them. And I will do the same thing with you. If there's a problem, I'll let you know. So there's nothing to be afraid of in this final clinical evaluation, okay? Page 18 is the, is the uh, topic we're going over. Uh, excuse me. I have two page 18s. Don't ask me why. I guess I printed it twice, okay? And then we go into the actual course itself, the reading outline. <clears throat> Again, 9-2 uh, is the first lecture for the Wednesday group. 9-14 is the first lecture for the Monday group. The first exam, I'm not going to go through every lecture. Um, but the first exam, again, the Wednesday group is 9-30, and the Monday group is 10-12, the first exam. If you look at the column, it'll explain to you about prep use. Okay? The second exam, well, let's go back to lecture number 10. That is the ATI management proctored exam. Okay. You'll uh, bring in proof that you did test B and you did remediation templates. You're going to show me proof of that right the day of the exam. You just bring that in. Okay. Exam, that's the ATI proctored. Exam two for the mental health part here is Wednesday group is 1118 and Monday is 1123. When you come to those exams, you'll bring in proof that you did your prep U for the appropriate chapters and your V-SIMs achieving a level four minimum, okay? Exam um, uh, on the 14th lecture will be the men mental health proctored. Again, you'll bring in proof of test B, mental health, and your, that you did the remediation templates. On Wednesday, 12-23, and uh, for the Wednesday group will be the final exam, and that'll be Monday, 1221 for the Monday group. And again, you'll bring in proof that you did the prep you chat. Okay? All right. If you have questions, you can email me. My office hours are going to be during what class time would have been. I am recording my lectures on YouTube. So you go on YouTube, you type in Professor Mangino, Professor Mike Mangino. If you see my brother, Billy, Mangino, he teaches at Hofstra. Ignore him. I'm more important than him. Okay. Um, 
but let's go. So the first lecture here today, let me see if I can set this up and get this squared away. And again, I apologize that I'm not particularly good at um, computers and I have to budge this somewhat, but we're gonna do our best. Okay, all right, let's see. How's that look? Well, that's not too bad. Well, first I wanna introduce you to my little friend, Sigmund. Here he is right there, Sigmund Freud, my little friend. He's, a, he's actually a thumb puppet. Okay, there he is right there. But let's carry on. Okay. I also want to say something else, and I apologize. I tend to bounce around. It's probably a little ADD that I have. We all have some form of mental disorders. It's not bad people that have these. It's human beings that have these disorders, just like asthma, diabetes, and things like that. If, and if you want to go for your RN, I suggest that as soon as you end this program, in the final semester, you apply to the RN program because you will, it's pretty much the same course. Okay? It's the same book. So you have the momentum. You're used to ATR. You're used to prep you. So if you want to go on, my suggestion is jump right into the RN program. And it doesn't have to be at Suffolk Community College. It could be at Farmingdale. It could be at Stony Brook. There's a, it could be at St. Joseph. There's a lot of opportunity out there for RN programs. Okay. The point I'm making is when you have this educational momentum, continue on. Because once you get used to money, it's hard to give it up, isn't it? Okay. Well, welcome to Psychiatric Nursing, uh, the best course in nursing school. That's half a joke. I love it, and I think it's important. But we want to remember one thing. Every patient in the hospital, every patient in the nursing home is suffering. They're not where they want to be. They probably want to be home with their children, things like that. So people in, particularly in hospitals, have anxiety, okay? And we can't just dismiss that and say, don't worry about it. We listen to them. What are you concerned about, Mrs. So-and-so, okay? Okay. This is the historical and physiological overview of Betterbeck chapters one, two, three, and four. Let's see if this is going to work. Yes, it is. I want to make clear there is no health without mental health, okay? If a person doesn't feel good about themselves, reasonably good about themselves, they're not really mentally healthy, okay? So you can be physically healthy, but if you're in a state of anxiety or depression, you're, you're not really healthy, okay, holistically. Let's talk about some of the people in this uh, arena here. Because there's a lot of people in the mental health field. The psychiatrists, they are MDs. They went to medical school. Uh, they are specialists in psychopharmacology. In other words, prescribing medicines that help um, uh, mental health disorders. In the past, uh, maybe 50 or 60 year, years ago, they probably got some training in psychoanalytic therapy, Freudian therapy. But now most psychiatrists specialize in medication. The psychologists, on the other hand, they are a PhD. They're not MDs. They have a PhD. That means eight years of college. They study Freud. They study Erickson. They study Piaget. They've studied the theorists. And they are specialists at individual talk therapy. Could be analytical. Could, could be cognitive behavioral. We'll talk about them in a little bit. Okay, they can also do psychometric testing such as IQ testing. But I wanna say something about IQ testing. I don't believe in IQ, I believe in hard work. That's how I got where I am and that's how you will get where you are. It's called hard work. And while I'm on this, I wanna say that I'm really proud of all of you because the work you did last semester during COVID last spring, do, doing these groups and these videos was incredible. I looked at these things and I said, man, you guys are getting this. You're becoming students. You, you, some of you just look so professional. It was fantastic. So I really want to give you some kudos that you did a great job. And we'll talk more about that. Okay. A psychiatric social worker. This is a person with a master's degree. My wife is a psychiatric social worker at the VA in Northport, where I met her. Um, they can do talk therapy, analytical, cognitive behavioral. They can also run groups, and they also can do discharge planning, which is a major uh, concern in mental health care because 
sometimes people with mental health problems, chronic mental health problems, may not have a place to live. Or a drug addict, you know, doesn't has to go to a rehab somewhere. Well, the social worker can run groups, they can do therapy, and they can do discharge planning. Psychiatric clinical nurse specialist, also known as a CNS, this is a master's prepared nurse. And what they generally do is they're on staff in a hospital to educate staff members, in this case, psychiatric nurses, about new treatments, things like that. A psychiatric nurse practitioner, which I am, okay, this is also a master's prepared nurse. But the NP in psych and NPs in general can prescribe medication, okay? Uh, early on in your career, you do need a collaborative, but after two years of working with a physician, uh, two years, uh, 3,600 hours, I believe, you no, no longer need a collaborative agreement. So you're completely an independent professional. The psychiatric RN. This is an RN, and this can include an LPN also. These are nurses that work on the hospital floors with the psychiatric patients. Okay, I'm going to try to move this up a little bit more, and maybe we can get it to be a little bigger. Let's see here. We've got to do that. So the RN, a uh, four-year, two-year RN, LPN, actually works on the floor. And I've got to be honest with you. I have uh, written prescriptions for patients, and I like being a floor RN, a floor nurse. Because when someone gets admitted to the psychiatric unit, especially for the first time, they're scared to death. The door locks behind them. They don't have the key. They're put in pajamas, and they wait. They see patients around them that are delusional, hallucinating, and they're very scared. So as nurses, as floor nurses, floor LPNs and RNs, we welcome them. We orient them, orient them to the unit. We reassure them that they're safe. And we also can offer them that they will leave in better shape than they came in. That doesn't mean they'll be perfect. It means they'll be in better shape. I often tell patients what we can achieve in two weeks in the hospital would take them six weeks as an outpatient. So they can get well so much quicker by being in the hospital, okay? So I really enjoyed being a floor nurse and you'll see me in clinical in action when I have you as students in East Long Island Hospital. I really enjoy that because I enjoy welcoming people, giving them not false reassurance, but we're gonna help them feel better. Oh, let's go on here. Well, let's talk about uh, mental health. There really is no universal accepted definition of mental health. It depends on society and cultural norms for that society. For example, killing in our country is not allowed unless sanctioned by the government. For example, in war, you're expected to kill and we have the death penalty. So the government can allow it, if they feel it's necessary, but as an individual, you cannot. Some countries do not have a death penalty. Most of the European countries got rid of the death penalty. Okay, well, there's no accepted definition of mental health, but there is some basics of mental health. An adult is autonomous and independent, okay? A mentally health person is striving for self-growth and striving for self-actualization. That's Maslow, right? You're getting your highest, you're achieving your highest ability. Okay. A mentally healthy adult can tolerate stress and the ambiguities of life. I want to go back to constant self growth. You will meet people in your life that complain, 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 and do nothing about it. That's not mentally healthy. In fact, all of you in nursing school right now are showing signs of mental health. Most of you are not 17 or 18. Most of you, the average age is probably 25, maybe 28. You had a life, but you weren't totally satisfied with it. You wanted something more from life. So you decided to go to nursing school. I'm gonna plug in my wife's computer so I don't lose her battery. That would not be good. So let me just get up here. There we go. Okay. So all of you should feel good that you're in nursing school and bettering yourself, that is a sign of mental health. But let's go back to tolerating stress and the ambiguities of life. 
let's think about the big ambiguities of life. And ambiguity means not knowing the answer, okay? You're, you're unsure. What are these big ambiguities? And these are three questions all of us ask ourselves sometime in our life. How did I get here? Or why was I born? What am I doing here? What's my purpose on earth? And where am I going? If you know what I mean, after you die, where am I going? Is there a heaven? And I ask of you now, what man-made institution in our society or every society tries to answer that question? The answer is religion. Religion tries to answer the ambiguities of life, that Catholic, that there's a heaven, things like that, okay? No one truly knows, but we want to believe that. And that is a personal belief. Okay? A mentally healthy adult is oriented to reality. They know what is real and what's not real. Someone who is schizophrenic and believes that they're um, that, that people are out to hurt them for no reason, that the next door neighbor is trying to poison them, their food's being poisoned, they're not oriented to reality. Or the bipolar who thinks that they're president of the United States, that's not oriented to reality. So that's not mentally healthy. Mentally healthy adult has self-esteem. They're aware of their abilities and their weaknesses and accept them. I am not good at math. I have to accept that, that I am not good at math. And it's probably related to the why I'm not good at computers also. I'm not good at, at small tasks. Okay? I have to accept that. In fact, when I was taking calculus, I took it three times. Finally, the third time, my, my professor kept giving me, giving me a W. And finally, she said, if you take me again, you study so hard, I will give you a C. You have to promise me that you'll never build a bridge and you'll never be an engineer. And I made her that promise. My, my ability is in a verbal ability. And that's why I'm a scientist. Also, um, they're able to interact with family and create friendships. A mentally healthy person, human being, has friends. People that don't have friends, there's something going on. Human beings are the most social animals on the face of the earth. How do I know that? Because Everybody has a cell phone. If we were cats, we wouldn't have cell phones because cats are solitary. They're not highly social. Human beings are highly, highly, highly social animals. And that's one of the problems with this COVID epidemic, pandemic, is that we are unable to be with people we love, family and friends, we get lonely. There's increased depression, there's increased anxiety, okay? So we are all held up in a fabric of socialization. And what happens with mental disorders is you drop out of that fabric that's holding you up with your friendship and your loved ones, and you fall out. And to get back up to that fabric that's holding you up can be difficult. With treatment, medication, people can get well. Always remember that. They can get well. I want to say always remember one other thing. Mental disorders are not logical. They are not logical. You're going to hear patients saying things that don't make sense. That's their mental disorder. That's not really them, though. That's their mental disorder. Over some weeks after they get treated, you will see that person that was delusional able to talk to you and have a conversation with you. And that's the fun of this, to see these people get well. Another fun part of mental health care is when someone gets admitted and doesn't want to accept treatment. They don't, they're refusing medication. I've had many patients like that. They're scared to death, okay? Our job is to educate them that the medication will help them. That's another fun part of this job, is to help them accept treatment. Okay, there's a book called the DSM-5. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, Volume 5. Um, it's a man-made document. Diagnosis on mental illness is based on past and present symptomatology, uh, what the patient described and what the clinician observed. It is a man-made document. In other words, there's no way to prove genetically or with a test that someone has depression or schizophrenia, at least not yet, okay? Basically, what we do is we look at the symptoms the patient has, 
and we find a diagnosis that incorporates most of those symptoms. Okay. Diagnoses are added and subtracted about every 10 years or so. They redo the DSM. So, in fact, up until 1980, if you were gay, you were considered mentally ill. We know that's nonsense. And that really was a lack of neutrality on the part of the people that wrote the DSM. Because they realized religion says, religion say you, you should not be gay, whatever. And people, most people are raised with religious values. So in about 19, they said, well, this is not fair. These people can love somebody. They work fine. They're not delusional. They're oriented to reality. They took it out. So prior to 1980, if you were gay, you were considered mentally ill. In fact, I worked with a patient when I was in going for my, uh, when I got my RN back in 1983, we went over to um, Pilgrim State. That's where I did my clinical rotation. And I worked with a man who was gay. Uh, he was caught in a homosexual relationship in the Civilian Conservation Corps. That was Franklin Roosevelt's way to employ people during the Great Depression prior to World War II. He was put in Pilgrim State Psychiatric Hospital from 1935 until the day he died in about 2001 or 2002. And I know he died about that time because I met a nurse at Stony Brook when I worked at Stony Brook and I asked him, I remembered his name, and I said, is Joe so-and-so still alive? She said, no, he passed away last year. So he was in the hospital for like 65 years. Now we say, well, why couldn't he be released? When someone is institutionalized for so long, it's hard to release them because society changes so quickly that he would not, he would have had difficulty adapting. Now, if someone is very, very, very intelligent and can adapt very quickly, it might have been different. I think this person may have an average IQ or slightly below. So he was kept in for most of his, all of his adult life. Very, very sad. I want to say something else. Humanity is getting kinder. You would not realize that because the news feeds us blood and guts and gore and terrible things that humanity does to each other. But if you go back in time, the, the rate of, of aggression and wars has decreased greatly over the last 500 years. If you want evidence of that, look up Steven Pinkers. He's a Harvard professor who did a study on human violent deaths about the DSM-5. Let's talk about the history of, of psychiatric treatment. Prior to modern times, prior to the 1790s, mentally ill were treated, they were dehumanized and this, they were treated with cruelty and confinement. So they were treated like animals. Sometimes they were believed to be possessed and they had to be punished for their sins. In fact, England back in the late 1700s or maybe 1760s, rounded up their mentally ill, put them on a ship and said, bye-bye. And they said, where are we going? We don't know, but you're leaving England. That was called the ship of fools. We in the United States are not much better. We just burned people at the stake because we thought they were witches. Sometimes they were put in amusement fairs and put in cages so people could gawk and laugh at them. Very, very cruel. But mental health care has a rich meaning full, rich, but very sad history. But you can change that, and we can change that, okay? Let's talk about dehumanization. When humans dehumanize other humans, that means that you don't see them as a human being. We can do what we want to them because our superego will not kick in. You remember Freud? I'm not sure if you guys took psych general psychology, but Freud studied the, the id, which is the kid, which is basically, I want to have fun now. I don't care about the consequences. Superego is your conscience and your mother and father saying, be kind to others, be a good boy. People dehumanize other people. Their superego doesn't kick in, so they can do whatever they want to them and feel no guilt at all. Psychiatric patients were seen as subhuman, allowing them to be treated as animals. During war, the enemy must be dehumanized, so we, the soldiers, can kill and name them without guilt. But I can tell you, I had uncles in World War II, and I worked with many a Vietnam vet, 
even the winners in war lose. Because when you come home from that war and you think of what you did to another human being, very hard to understand that. And that's actually called, my wife taught me, a moral injury. Your mother told you, your father told you, don't hurt anybody, be kind to others. And then you go to World War II or Vietnam, and they tell you the gooks, which were the Vietnamese, and the Krauts, which were the Germans, they're, they're not human, you must kill them. And you do that, otherwise you would be killed. And then when you come home, you, you rethink all this stuff over and over. Again, if, if that becomes a problem, it's time to seek treatment. Okay? In Viet Vietnam, we're called gooks during the Vietnam War. So there are basic four modern periods in mental health care. The first period was about 1790s to the 1850s. That's called the caring period, also known as the period of enlightenment. Asylums, asylum literally means safe haven. We accept people in America, political asylum. In other words, they would be killed by their government. So they come to America to have political asylum, political safe haven. So asylums were set up around the 1850s or the 1790s to the 1850s to care for the mentally ill. The curing state, uh, uh, stage two here, the curing period, 1850s to 1950s. Uh, Freud was born in about 1860 or so. There was a lot of theorists coming about. Erickson, uh, Freud again, Piaget, studying the human mind. Okay, then about the 1850s, period three here. We had medications. The first psychiatric medicine was, was chlorpromazine, also known as Thorazine. Not used too much nowadays anymore because we have much better medicines with less side effects, and we'll learn about that as the course goes on. And then in the in the mid '60s, we went into the community period. Now, uh, the 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 institutions, the asylums were getting expensive. Kings Park, um, Pilgrim State, Central Islip. So patients were discharged to the community, okay? The problem was they didn't have the wherewithal to handle themselves in a community. In other words, all their needs were met for many, many years, just like the patient I spoke about who was gay. And now we discharge them and say, here's your bottle of meds, go live your life. Well, they didn't take their meds sometimes. So then they were delusional, or they thought people had to get them, so they hurt that person they thought was going to hurt them, then they end up in jail. Sadly, the biggest mental health care provider in America is our criminal justice system. I find that very, 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 very sad, that the richest country in the world cannot even treat its mentally ill. We put them in prison and treat them as criminals. That, to me, is sad. But we can change that. You can change that. If you become a psych nurse, you can help people not get into prison by educating them about their medicine and taking their meds. Okay? Talk a little bit about, so during the period um, from the 1850s to 1950s, Freud was around and he was developed as his period too. He really started out uh, he was a regular physician, an MD, and he tried to hypnotize people, but people couldn't really be hypnotized. So he had them lay on the couch and free associate. What does that mean? Free association means you say whatever comes to your mind without editing. You just blurb out whatever thoughts are coming to your mind. Eventually, the therapist will identify a theme. We all have themes. Common themes could be inferiority, superiority, could be a theme of guilt, guilty conscience, things like that. So that was Freudian therapy. But let's step back to neutrality. Freud said, we must come to the therapeutic relationship with no prejudices or expectations of how you think the patient should be. Okay, So we're neutral. We don't have an agenda to make the patient think the way we think. That's called being neutral. We respect the client no matter what their history. And you may hear some histories that are very upsetting. During the crack epidemic, 
I heard stories of it makes me upset and angry all at the same time of parents selling their children. I won't tell you for what. I'll leave it up to your imagination. Crack cocaine. That's how addictive crack is. You may hear things that are very upsetting. We cannot let the patient know that we're upset. Okay, they have enough guilt and enough shame already. We'll talk more about that. We are not neutral with our kids. We can raise our kids, our children, to be who we, who we would like them to be. We don't do that with the patients. The job of the nurse and the mental health professional is have the patient become who they want to become, provided they're not going to harm themselves or others. If you want to be psychotic in America, you can do that legally. I think there's a better life out there for you, not being psychotic. But if you want to be psychotic, you can legally be psychotic in America, provided you don't hurt anybody. If you want to do drugs in America, you can. Of course, they're illegal and you might get in some legal troubles. So our job is to educate people, drug addicts, mentally ill people, that there's a better life with treatment. Okay? But we, 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 we don't push on them what our values are. That would be a lack of neutrality. And we assist patients to be who they want to be, not what we want them to be, unless they're going to harm themselves or other. And this is probably the most difficult concept in, in all of mental health care. Holding back our values and not putting them on the patient. It's very difficult to do that because all of us were raised in environments, and usually we think that childhood and family grew up is the right way to view life. Now, sometimes parents make mistakes and children realize this is not right, things like that. But many of us grow up in a certain value system from our parents, and we feel the whole world has to have our values. That's not true. Okay. All right. Well, I do a little experiment with you guys. I'm going to demonstrate neutrality, or I'm going to demonstrate a lack of neutrality. Here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to get a piece of paper and a pen, and I want you to write down the first thought that comes to your mind after I say a series of words. Okay, get your pen, get your paper. I'll give you a couple of a minute or so, or a couple of seconds here. I'm going to mention a word, and I want you to write down the first thought that comes to your head when you hear this word. Ready? Milk. Write down. Don't think about it. Just write down what comes the thought that comes to your head. Okay. I'm going to mention another word or two, and I want you to write down the first thought that comes to your head. Male prostitute. I venture to say the thoughts that you have associated with milk are much more positive than the thoughts you have associated with male prostitute. Okay. Milk, it's pure, it's white, it's clean, it's good for you. Male prostitute, um, I don't know, not healthy, not good, things like that. Okay? All right. Here. Freud also talked about transference. Hold on one second. I think somebody's at my door. No, they just left. I like it. Okay. Freud talked about transference. Transference is when we remind patient of someone in the past and the patient projects that emotion onto us. They're transferring their feelings, usually of their parents, onto us. I, When I was working in the Department of Probation, I had a patient come in and look at me and say, you are a ass. And I said, but you don't, even, you don't know me. He goes, you remind me of my father, and I hate my father. That is classic transference. We can work with that. We can say, well, talk to me about your father. Your father upsets you. You're angry your father. What's going on there? So we can use that as an in to talk, have the patient talk about their issues. Talk about countertransference. When patient reminds us of someone in the past and we project, the clinician, the nurse, projects those feelings onto the patient. Classically, and I hope you don't do this, you're admitting a, an alcoholic uh, in the ER to a unit, and your father was an alcoholic or a drug addict, and you're angry at this alcoholic or drug addict. The voice in your head is saying, I hate these people. They're so bad. 
what you're really saying is that you haven't resolved issues from your childhood, okay? We should never, as nurses, have countertransference get involved in our caring for a patient. If you have this thought in your head that you hate these patients, you need to not work in that area, or you need to go to therapy and talk to somebody about why you have these feelings, okay? And again, it doesn't make you bad. It makes you a human being. All of us are products of our childhood. Our parents raised us. We grew up in their value systems. It, they have problems. Parents are not are perfect. They have their own problems. And they're trying to raise children with those problems. Or, or, you know, they have their own problem. They're trying to raise children. And they have all this pressure on them from work. Things like that. Maslow, again, he was during the... This period to 1850, about 1950, Maslow studied a hierarchy of human needs. He said the first human need is oxygen, the next one is water, the next one is food and then sleep. And then we go to safety of our body, health, family, property. Then we go to love and belonging. And then we go to self-esteem. And the top of this triangle, I don't have it presented in a triangle format, but if you look in your book in Betterbeck, it will be a triangle. The top of that triangle is what Maslow calls self-actualization. All above needs are met. A person has reached their full potential, accepts an imperfect world, okay? Most people never achieve this. And I would say in America, we always want more. We want more. We want more. We want more, okay? So, so self-actualization is you realize the world is imperfect. You try to make it better. You do your best with that. You accept things the way they are. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try to change a world that's imperfect, though. Okay, self-actualization. It's very interesting. The first physiologic need is oxygen. And I just want you to think, how many ways can you get oxygen in your body? Three. You have two nostrils and a mouth. That is not a coincidence. Because if your nose gets clogged with the cold, at least you can breathe through your mouth. Okay, if you have something in your mouth, at least you can breathe through your nose. If we look at humanity through evolution, things tend to make sense. I urge you to view humanity, whether it's physiological and physical adaptation or psychological adaptation, view it through an evolutionary lens and it will make sense. We are... Nurses are, are biologists. In fact, nursing is a bio, psycho, social profession. Nursing is a combination of many different professions wrapped up into one. Basically, what we do is we study human suffering. Okay. You might say, why do we have to know all these theories, all these theorists, all these theories, how come? Knowing theories of human psychological development allows us to know what is appropriate behavior for a client at a particular age or stage. It allows us to deliver appropriate care based on accepted models of treatment for that age and stage. For example, if a five-year-old boy was talking about intercourse, we know this would be inappropriate and we would it would require us to investigate further, okay? Nowadays with the internet, that five-year-old boy is savvy enough, he could probably get onto pornographic sites, but we would question, say, gee, you know about this. Where did you learn about this? Okay, so knowing theories allows us to know where a patient should be at a certain age in their, or stage in their life. It also allows us to give uh, appropriate care based on current models of treatment. We just can't do what we want to do as nurses. We don't work in a vacuum. You, your, every intervention you do must be based in some, some kind of theory. That's why you take this course. Plow, she was a nursing theorist, one of the greatest nursing theorists. She coined the term therapeutic alliance. That means <clears throat> that the patient trusts us. Okay? Patients come into the psychiatric unit, they're scared. They're afraid of us. But over time, as we talk to them, they begin to realize that we're not against them. We're on their side. We're here to get them well. I've told many a patient when I work in the VA in Northport, I know you don't want to be here, but the doctor's worried about you. 
I want to see you on the golf course having a great life. But if you need to be here, we're here to help you. So the goal is to get patients well and let them move on. We also felt that nurses should be active on the unit, creating a therapeutic environment. We talked about stages of the therapeutic relationship. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. Okay, there was Erwin Yalom. He was the father of group therapy. He studied groups. So people can get psychiatric treatment in individually with a therapist or in group therapy. AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, is a form of group therapy. Okay, And what did he talk about groups? Groups can be ed for education and learning. In fact, I may very well give a lecture out there at the hospital. You'll see me lecture the people on the drug, the drug rehab unit. I find those patients like to learn and, and I like to teach. So groups are, can be for education and learning, they can be for inspiration and hope, they can be for socialization, they can be for acceptance and belonging, they can give a feeling of universality, meaning the person begins to realize they're not the only one with this problem. Many psychiatric patients feel, feel alone, no one understands them, but they're the only one with that problem. And when they get in a group and they see other patients that may be depressed or have alcohol or substance abuse problems, they realize they're not alone. That makes them feel better, right? A group can also give you insight. In other words, insight means sight inward into your problems and how behaviors affect others. So if group therapy, is a, someone in group therapy might be a bragging a lot or whatever, and a group member might say, you know, you, you brag a lot about yourself, and I don't really like that. And the patient might say, I do, I didn't realize that. That person has gained some insight. It doesn't mean we have to take everybody's critique of us literally, but we can look at it. If someone says something about me, I'll say, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Okay. And we're still in period two. So period two involved, you know, Freud and Erickson. It also involved other treatments. They really didn't have medications at this point. So they tried anything they could to get the patient well. In fact, one of this treatment was to inject a lot of insulin into the patient, put them in an insulin-induced coma. The feeling was we could put them in this coma and they could rest their mind and that would get them well. That didn't work. So let's try something different. We're going to try a frontal lobotomy. We're going to, that used to be felt at the frontal part of the brain above the eyes, the frontal lobe, which we'll talk about, was the site of aggression. So if we go in there with a drill and drill away the aggressive part of your brain, your aggression would go away. Well, that didn't work because there isn't one aggressive part of the brain. Okay. In fact, it's the frontal load that usually controls our behavior. We'll talk more about that. But the frontal lobotomies, in fact, when I was a new nurse back in the early 80s, when I was working in a, a psychiatric unit in the hospital, I saw a patient with what looked like three little... You know, when you get a coconut, there's those three little marks on the top of the coconut. Above his eye, he had, on his forehead, had these three, three little, like, scars. And I said to the nurse's aide, hey, Robbie, what's that patient? He goes, that's where they did frontal lobotomies on him. Well, they didn't want to leave scars anymore doing frontal lobotomies. So a doctor came up with a different way to do a lobotomy. He would take an ice pick and jam it. In above your eye, right in your eye socket, up, up straight up into your frontal lobe. Of course, that didn't work. It didn't leave a scar, but it didn't work. There was also hydrotherapy. Uh, water or ice used to calm a patient down. Back in the hospital I worked at in the early 80s, there was this giant bathtub, big cast iron bathtub, like eight feet long and two or three feet wide. I asked Robbie, the nurse who had been there for like 50 years working, he said, Robbie, what's up with this bathtub, man? He says, that's where, before we had Thorazine in the late 40s and early 50s, if a patient was violent and out of control, we would bring him over to the bathtub, put him in the tub, and pack the bathtub with ice. Yes, that would get you unviolent because you'd be shivering to death. Okay? It didn't really work long term. Okay. Well, there was another treatment that came about, I believe it originated in Italy, called ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. Electricity is 
put into the patient's brain. It induces a seizure. And the thought here was they could get rid of uh, psychosis because the theory was that people with seizure disorders, epilepsy, could not become psychotic. It did not work. But we actually still use ECT to this day. It is a very, very effective treatment for depression. Predominantly, 95% of the time, it's used for intractable depression, depression that does not respond to medication or other treatments. Occasionally, it's used for intractable bipolar or intractable psychosis. Um, the name electroconvulsive therapy turns a lot of patients off. So I'm going to ask you guys to come up with a name, a different name for ECT, and present it to me either via the computer or in clinic. Okay. So again, during this period, too, they were trying anything and everything they could to find treatments for mental disorders. Okay. Well, then came period three, around the 1950s, the advent of the first meds. Again, Thorazine, chlorpromazine was the first antipsychotic. Then came lithium. It was discovered from, I believe, in a lithium uh, spring in Switzerland, I believe, where people would go to the spring and come back very relaxed. And the doctor said, gee, what's in that water? Well, he went to the water, studied it, and found lithium. Uh, MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. First one was isone, I, isoniazid. That was discovered as an anti, the first antidepressant, as were tricyclic antidepressants. Okay, let's go back to MAOIs. You may not know this, the Ammerman campus was actually a TB, a tuberculosis hospital back in the 40s and 50s before it came a community college. They would treat people with isoniazid, it's an antibiotic, tuberculosis, and they noticed their mood got elevated. So this was a serendipitous, a very serendipitous means just a good thing happens out of the blue. It was the first antidepressant. And then came the tricyclics, we'll talk about them, we get more to mood. Then in the 1960s came benzodiazepines, one of the first ones was Valium. In fact, it had such an effect on our culture, the Rolling Stones wrote a song about it. That little yellow pill, actually it was, it was a mother's helper, that yellow, little yellow pill outside the door, she took four more. Valium is a yellow pill. Period four. Okay, the meds were working pretty well. Psych hospitals were expensive, as I said. Care in the psych hospitals was considered substandard. So the patients were discharged to the community with insufficient support. They didn't take their meds. They became psychotic. They became homeless. They committed crimes. They got arrested. And like I said before, the biggest healthcare provider, mental health care provider in the United States is the prison system. And I have a citation there, New York Times 2914. Again, citing where we get this material is very, very important. Okay. And it says here, uh, over 50% of, of prisoners are mentally ill. And I would say it's more like 99%. Many of those patients are there for drugs and alcohol. And drug and alcohol addiction is a true mental disorder. In fact, I made that our very first lecture. So we're going to start that probably, um, our first clinical lecture, we'll start that next week. In mental health care, we are handicapped. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we have no lab values, no blood work that says if somebody's mentally ill. We have no blood work that says someone's getting well. We have no x-rays, we have no MRIs, we have no CAT scans. So in some sense, mental health care is more difficult than physical health care. You know, you break your leg, you get an x-ray, the doctor sees the broken leg and fixes it. We don't have that ability in mental health care. So it's we use an interdisciplinary approach. It should involve all members involved with patients' care, um, nurses, psychologists, social workers, MD, recreation therapy, occupational therapy, etc. All these members have different areas of expertise so they can offer different treatment options. It also decreases the chance of personal biases. Remember, none of us are truly neutral. 
we did that little experiment before, and we don't want to put our bias on the patient. So when you have a whole team of people discussing a patient, you reduce the chance of biases. Okay? Decisions, decisions of care are made by all, not by an individual. Thus, the patient can't blame one person. The psychiatrist is the team leader. Okay? They ultimately make the decisions for patient care. A good psychiatrist listens to the social worker, listens to the nurses, listens to the recreational therapists. Okay? So, so everybody in the team is respected. Again, if a decision is made, it's not made by one person, it's, it's made by the team. In fact, during one of the meetings when I worked in a psychiatric hospital, the, uh, the night before the patient was on the phone, got so angry, he, he ripped the phone off the wall. So the team met the next morning and uh, they said, we have decided that the patient can, is on a 24 hour phone ban, not as punishment, for the patient to concentrate on his own treatment. I went out, I was designated as a nurse to tell the patient this. I went out and I said to the patient, Mr. So-and-so, the team has decided um, because of your issue last night in, in ripping the phone off the wall, the team has decided that they don't want you to use the phone for 24 hours. He got very angry and I said to him, I don't didn't make that decision. The people in that room over there made that decision. They just told me to tell you that. If you want to speak to them, come over here, we can go talk. Again, it was not punishment. It was to have the patient focus on their own mental health with no distractions from the outside world. Okay, let's go on. Now, basically, very basically, there are two types, common types of therapy, and I'm talking talking therapy. Psychoanalytical or psychodynamic. Psychoanalytical is when you lay on the couch and you pre-associate. I discussed this a little while ago. Psychodynamic is very similar, but in this case, you're facing your therapist sitting on, you'll be sitting in the chair. Usually you'll be sitting on the couch facing the patient, uh, facing your therapist, okay? And it's based on free association. Whatever comes to your mind, just talk about it. Okay, some people go to therapy, they go into the therapist's office, the therapist says, welcome here, sit down, and there is silence. The therapist is just waiting to see what the patient says. Because remember, it's about the patient, not about us. That's Freudian-based therapy, psychoanalytical or psychodynamic. Uh, cognitive behavioral, okay, is based on changing thoughts and behaviors. Cognitions mean thoughts, okay. Uh, uh, Beck and Burns, they wrote a book called Feeling Good. They were uh, one of the fathers of, of cognitive behavioral therapy, as was Albert Ellis. Okay, that came about in the 60s and 70s. Let me go back a second. Freud believed that feelings produced thoughts. Cognitive therapists believe that thoughts produce feelings. Just think about that a little bit. I tend to believe that feelings produce thoughts. Because if I don't get a good night's sleep, I don't have very nice thoughts. And as my wife tells me, I'm pretty cranky. The cognitive therapists believe in the opposite. They believe if we change your thoughts, your cognitions, we can change your feelings. Okay? And again, there's no right and wrong here. Well, let's take a look a little bit about the human nervous system. Because remember, we as nurses deal with biology brain, the nervous system, and psychology. Okay? Again, nursing is a bio-psycho-social profession. Okay. The CNS stands for Central Nervous System. That is your brain. And part of the brain, neurons, axons of nerves, actually come out of the brain and go down the spinal cord. So you can think of the spinal cord as is, is just an extension of the brain. What's very interesting here is the brain is undoubtedly the most vital organ of any animal. It is protected by the skull. If you look at the arm, the, the bones of your arm and your leg, the bones are inside. The muscle is covering them. But through evolution, once again, the brain is so important 
that through evolution, the bone was put on the outside. Spinal cord is in the vertebrae. There's a disorder called spina bifida, where the, the vertebrae have not closed enough and part of the spinal cord is coming out, okay? All of the nerves that stick out, that come out of the spinal cord are called the peripheral nervous system or PNS. I just had a thought, a race in my mind, I lost it, it'll come back in a few minutes. Let me just stop and think about it. Central nervous Yes. Another vital organ in our body is the heart. What is that protecting us? The rib cage. Once again, through millions of years of evolution, the human body evolved, and animals' bodies, that the vital organs of the brain and the heart are protected by bone. Also, when you look at your arm and you see vessels, those are veins. The arteries are deeper down in your muscle because they're protected by the muscle. If you cut an artery, you're going to bleed to death because it's under, that's your blood pressure. Okay? When you cut a vein, the pressure in the, in, in the veins is much lower than the pressure in, in the arteries. So the art wants to get through evolution. Nature and God, believe in both, have made the, the arteries be protected by the muscle. The cerebrum, okay, this is the, if you took away someone's, cut someone's skull cap off, you would see the cerebrum, that's the surface of the brain, largest part of the brain in humans, divided into two hemispheres and anatomical positions. Okay, we're going to look at that in a second. Here we go. There we go. So that is the different lobes of, of the cerebrum, okay. Uh, let's start in the front. We see the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is really controlling behavior. It's very interesting here, evolutionarily, if you go to your base of the back of your neck, that's the reptilian brain, where the brain meets the neck. It's called the reptilian brain. It has to do with breathing, eating, going to the bathroom, very basic functions. As you go up your skull toward the frontal lobe, you get more advanced functions. We, human beings, have very large forehead. Okay. Frontal lobe is also part of the, what I'll call the prefrontal lobe. The prefrontal lobe and the frontal lobe has to do with executive functioning, planning ahead and things like that. It also has to do with the appreciation of, of art, abstract thinking. My dog, very sad, they had to put him to sleep about a year ago. I never heard my dog listen to a rock and roll song and say, that is such great music, Daddy, play more. Well, I listen to Led Zeppelin or the Allman Brothers, my favorite bands, and I get a warm feeling. I like that. that. So human, the human brain is highly advanced. We can go back more and look part of the center of the brain there is the limbic system. Up above is the motor strip, sensory strip, parietal lobe, thalamus, occipital lobe, cerebellum. Okay. So that's the human brain. And what differentiates us from other animals is a large frontal and prefrontal lobe. Anatomical areas of the cerebral cortex. So, so the cerebrum was, it was also called the cerebral cortex. The word cortex means cork because it looks like cork. The temporal lobe, let's go back one. The temporal lobe, where is it? Right over here. Uh, has to do with the processing of hearing, taste, and smell. The occipital lobe, right over there, has to do with processing of visual stimuli. The parietal lobe, right over, where is the, we, we, the parietal lobe here? Actually, I don't, see, oh, there it is right there, parietal lobe. That has to do with the um, processing of sensation, taste, and touch. Again, frontal prefrontal lobes, executive intellectual functioning, and personality, emotions, and judgment. People with ADD, attention deficit disorder, are said to have their frontal lobe is not optimally functioning. We actually treat ADD and ADHD with stimulants. People say, why the heck would you give a hyperactive child a stimulant? Because when you give them a stimulant, you activate their frontal lobe by increasing neurotransmitters. We'll learn about that soon, especially dopamine and norepinephrine. 
and you wake up the frontal lobe, and now the frontal lobe can control the hyperactive child or person's behavior. In other words, they have more self-control. We'll get to that. Very exciting, isn't it? Well, the brain has a lot of anatomical parts, and it also has some brain systems. Many areas of the brain combine to create a system. There are two that we are concerned about. Actually, there's a couple. Limbic system, this is the emotional system of the brain. It's comprised of the amygdala, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the hippocampus. The word, the word amygdala means almond, by the way, because it's almond-shaped. The extrapyramidal system involves involuntary movement, reflex, and posture. There are movement disorders, side effects of antipsychotic meds. We'll see that when we get to schizophrenia. Okay, we'll talk about more about this system when we get to schizophrenia. Let's go on. Um, the autonomic nervous system. You can think of the autonomic nervous system as the automatic nervous system because usually it's, we cannot control it. The autonomic nervous system is divided into two subdivisions. Sympathetic is fight or flight. The primary neurotransmitter here is epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. The parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest. The primary neurotransmitter there is acetylcholine. Sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are in a seesaw type balance. Thus, if we increase one, we decrease the other. If we decrease acetylcholine, we decrease the parasympathetic nervous system, increasing the sympathetic nervous system. If we decrease adrenaline, we decrease the sympathetic nervous system, thus increasing the parasympathetic nervous system. Once again, I find this fascinating. I hope you do too. Let's talk about anticholinergic side effects. The older antipsychotics, and we'll get to them in a little bit, and the older antidepressants blocked acetylcholine, or they decreased acetylcholine, okay? Anticholinergic either block acetylcholine release or block its action. Examples of anticholinergics are atropine, again, antipsychotics, the older ones, TCAs, known as tricyclic antidepressants. Also, Benadryl, I guess I left out a comma there, I apologize. Benadryl has anticholinergic side effects. In fact, if you take a lot of Benadryl, you will get constipated. When we talk about anticholinergic side effects, what are we talking about? Constipation, dry mouth, increased sweating. Mydriasis, which is a fixed dilation of the pupil, bronchodilation, tachycardia, which is a rapid heartbeat, etc. Well, that's too hard to remember. So let's look at this one to remember it. When you have anticholinergic side effects, you're hot as a hair, hypothermia, hypothermia, blind as a bat because your pupils are fixed open, mouth is dry as a bone, and your face is red as a beak because of vasodilation. Again, too hard to remember. Or we can say, can't uh, can see, can pee, can spit, can. I'll let you read that there. Okay, I think I have them in the wrong order, but I think you get the gist of it. We'll talk more about anticholinergic side effects as we go through the medications as we get to the top. Again, uh, a neuron, a, a neuron is a nerve cell. It has a cell body. Okay, the cell body receives signals from. Um, Dendrites, okay, they send it to the cell body, it gets processed in the cell body, and then it goes down the axon to a synaptic space. That's a very microscopic space. At the other end of that space is another dendrite. So nerves are separated from each other by a synaptic space, but they can communicate by chemicals that they release into that space, and those chemicals are called neurotransmitters. Okay, neurotransmitter is released by electrical impulse from the presynaptic neuron. Neurotransmitter will travel by diffusion across the synaptic cleft, meaning space, to a specific receptor on the postsynaptic neuron. If the neurotransmitter is excitatory, the postsynaptic neuron is turned on. An electrical impulse is sent down that neuron to release a neurotransmitter at the next synapse. So we can divide neurotransmitters into two areas, excitatory or inhibitory. When they're excitatory, it turns on the next nerve down the pike. 
if it's inhibitory, it turns off. It prevents that nerve from firing and all the nerves down the pipe. Okay. If inhibitory neurotransmitter release from presynaptic neuron, then postsynaptic nerve cell does not send an impulse. Okay. And again, you can email me questions. My office hours are going to be during what would have been our normal class time on Monday and Wednesday. After the neurotransmitter is released from its receptor, the neurotransmitter is cycled back into the presynaptic neuron from where it was released, to be released again when another electrical impulse comes down that nerve. The neurotransmitter can also be broken down by enzymes in the synaptic space, synaptic cleft. That enzyme is called MAO, monoamine oxidase, acetylcholine esterase, and the COMT, some others. Okay. Neurotransmitter components is, are, are reabsorbed into the presynaptic neuron and then reassembled into a whole neurotransmitter. Again, we're going to go over this and over this. This really is chapter two right now. When you study chapter two, I want you to concentrate on the neuron. I want you to draw a picture of a neuron how they get released and reuptake and things like that. Okay, neurotransmitters. We are addressing psychiatric functions here. Neurotransmitters have many functions. Adrenaline helps regulate blood pressure, helps regulate energy levels, it helps regulate anxiety. We're talking about the, the psychiatric functions of these neurotransmitters. Okay, excitatory, perpetuates the act's potential. That means that nerve fires in the postsynaptic neuron. So when dopamine or norepinephrine are released and hit a receptor on the nerve cell, it makes that nerve fire. That nerve fires the next nerve off, the next nerve off, the next nerve, and so on down the pipe. Epinephrine, adrenaline, okay, same thing, energy, fight or flight. Coffee actually elevates adrenaline indirectly, okay? And that's why coffee gets us excited and gives us energy. Dopamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It's also involved with movement. In fact, there's a disorder when someone does not have enough dopamine called Parkinson's disease. We also know through the work of a very famous brain researcher here on Long Island named Stephen Dewey, that dopamine is the pleasure neurotransmitter. When people do drugs, whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, cocaine, or heroin, they want to elevate their dopamine. That's why they go back and do more of it. Acetylcholine is involved with the parasympathetic nervous system. Like I said, it is also a neurotransmitter involved in memory. Glutamate is another very common excitatory neurotransmitter. They're not really sure of its exact function right now. They might be developing antipsychotic medicines that can decrease dopamine. And we'll talk more about it later on in the course. Serotonin, I like to think of it as both excitatory and inhibitory because it can decrease anxiety yet elevate mood. Okay? It is said to be low in depression and possibly with anxiety, like I said. And we'll discuss more of that when we get to the mood and anxiety level. Inhibitory neurotransmitters, when they're released, they inhibit the postsynaptic nerve from from carrying the active potential. In other words, they prevent the postsynaptic nerve from firing. GABA stands for GABA amino, uh, gamma amino butyric acid. It is the most common, ubiquitous means very common, inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. In fact, people may drink a liquid on Friday and Saturday evenings, hopefully not too much more than that, it calms them down. That liquid is called alcohol and it elevates GABA. That's how it calms you down. We'll talk more about that when we get to the drug addiction lecture. There are other uh, inhibitory neurotransmitters called endorphins. Let's take a look at that word. What does the word endo mean? It means from within. Fiend, in that word here, morphine, endorphine. It literally means you have morphine in your brain that your body produces. Why does your body produce it? Because back in the day, a thousand years ago, every couple of days, the saber-toothed tiger would get hungry and he would chase you and you would release a lot of adrenaline, a lot of dopamine to run like crazy and get away. Hopefully you do. 
But if he caught you and was chomping on you, you would release endorphins so you wouldn't feel the pain at that point. You could still fight. In fact, if any of you have ever been in a bad car accident, you get in this accident, crash, smash, there's glass flying, oh my God, it's terrible. You get out of the car, you look at your car, it's, you know, it's smoked everywhere. Oh my God, what happened? Oh, you're very upset. And you're, as you calm down, about 20 minutes later, you feel the pain in your arm. Your arm is broken, but you didn't feel it during the accident or after the accident because your body released massive amounts of endorphins nature and God says it's dangerous there. Get out of that situation. Release adrenaline, run, release endorphins so you don't feel pain. When you're away from the car or the saber-toothed tiger, then you can lick your wounds. Then you can calm down. So endorphins are the body's morphine. Basically, it's heroin. We have five senses. Uh, hearing, auditory, smell, olfactory, taste, gustatory, touch, uh, tactile, uh, eyes, vision up there, right? Okay. With these senses, we take in data from our environment. That data is sent to our brain. Our brain processes that. The brain is basically the central computer, and the brain decides what to do. If you're in a threatening situation, you release adrenaline dopamine to fight the saber-toothed tiger or get away from the car that is on fire. A nervous system is all about survival. Plants do not have nervous systems. When a storm comes, a storm that we had last week or so, the oak trees just fall over. They cannot run away. They have no nerves, they have no muscles. Animals, on the other hand, can go into their burrows, people go into their houses, they go underground to get away from the wind and the rain. So a nervous system is God's gift to survive. Well, people are born with different predispositions to release certain neurotransmitters. A person with, an, with an anxiety disorder probably releases excessive amounts of adrenaline or does not have enough GABA. Because remember, GABA is, the, is a neurotransmitter that calms the brain down. People with paranoia, paranoid schizophrenia perhaps, probably have too much dopamine. In fact, we will talk about people that do a lot of cocaine, particularly crack cocaine, and literally think, that there are police up in the trees taking their pictures. I'll tell you that story when we get to drug addiction. So these um, levels of neurotransmitters are regulated by genetics. So genetics is really the the basic of our nervous of our nervous system, and things come out of that. You can think of your genetics as the current in the river, pushes you in one direction. Can you fight that current in the river? Can you fight your neurotransmitters? Yes. Meditation, things like that, calm people down. People learn meditation and mindfulness to calm down when they're anxious. So there's ways we can kind of reel in our out-of-control neurotransmitters. Another way would be medicine. Oh, use of medication. They can correct neurotransmitter imbalances, thus allowing the person to function better. They can help control disease progression. They can help prevent kindling. Well, kindling, it's in chapter two. Kindling means, it comes from the term kindling for a fire. Small twigs is the way you start a fire. Well, this originated out of seizure disorders. Uh, people that have their first seizure, without treatment, it is easier to get future seizures. In other words, you need less of a stimulus to give you another seizure because that nerve pathway is primed to fire readily. It needs less of a stimulus. That's the concept of kindling. Well, that concept of kindling now applies to mental health. Once you have your first panic attack, once you have your first depressive episode, once you have your first psychotic break, without treatment, it's easier to get more psychosis, more depression, more anxiety. So treatment with medication is very, very, very important. It also, I want to add, helps the brain heal. These medicines correct neurotransmitter transmission imbalances, okay? It's a little like prednisone. Someone who's having an asthma attack, 
they take prednisone and it calms down their, their, their immune system to not be as reactive to the dust or whatever they're allergic to, okay? It helps the body kind of reset itself. So medicines not only correct imbalances, not help, only help disease progression, not only help control kindling, but can also help the brain heal. In fact, patients can be on antidepressants for a while, the brain heals and we can take them off that antidepressant and some patients may never need it again. Although some patients may need it again, but not all. Okay, let's talk about some classes of medication. Anti-anxiety agents, uh, also called anxiolytic. Lytic means lysis, to break apart. Lysol breaks apart germs and bacteria, okay? When we think of anti-anxiety agents, the biggest class here are benzodiazepines, that's Valium. Um, Alprazolam, which is uh, Xanax, Alprazepam, which is Ativan, the whole class of benzodiazepines, there's probably about 30 of them. We also know that SSRIs, such as Prozac and Zoloft and Paxil and Lexapro and Celexa, can also decrease anxiety by elevating serotonin. Anxiety, we'll talk about that. Antidepressants, the tricyclics, TCAs, MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, SSRIs, again, Prozac and Paxil. And there's another class called SSNRIs. They stand for Selective Serotonin Norepinephrine Reuptake Inhibitors. Norepinephrine is very, very similar to epinephrine, which we know is adrenaline. There are mood stabilizers. Lithium is the, is the best uh, uh, um, mood stabilizer we have, but it has many side effects. We now use anti-seizure medicines to help uh, treat bipolar disorder. Mood stabilizers are used for people with bipolar. We'll talk to that. Mood. Okay, we can also use GABAergic drugs such as Bend. Okay. Antipsychotics can be used to they block the dopamine receptor so your dopamine can't get to it. If your dopamine can't get to it, not only do you calm down, but you get rid of your paranoia and your psychosis. Again, We'll talk about these medicines in more detail when we get to the illnesses, illnesses that they help treat. Chapter two is a very brief summary of all those. Okay. Okay. Well, I know this is old news for you guys. It's 20 or 30 years old now, but the 1990s was the decade of the brain. Why the 1990s? Because what happened during the 1990s is was there were new technologies out such as MRIs got very sophisticated, CAT scans got very sophisticated. In other words, as we had computers, we could really use MRIs and really have them give us vivid pictures. Okay, so computers got more sophisticated during the 90s. There's also PET scans, which stands for positron emission tomography. A PET scan measures glucose metabolism. If you remember from biology, the brain can only metabolize glucose, which is the most simple sugar. Well, what they do is they put, they tag that glucose with radioactivity. They inject it into you, into your veins. It goes to your brain. They put you in the PET scan machine, and they can look at what part of your brain is damaged or not working. In fact, Stephen Dewey took people that were doing crack, addicted to crack, injected them with radioactive glucose, and Oh, part of their brain was shut down. It was not dead. Out of neurotransmitters. Addiction. Also, SPECT scan, single photon emission tomography. That measures blood flow in the brain so they can see if someone had a stroke, things like that. So the 1990s was a revolutionary time in mental health care. Not only did we have great uh, new technologies to, to study the brain, but also it was the first time we had atypical or newer antipsychotics. The older antipsychotics, Thorazine and Haldol, were dirty, meaning they had a lot of side effects. The newer ones are relatively clean, meaning they have less side effects. We'll talk about that when we get to schizophrenia. Conclusion. We have come a long way from years ago, progressing from not caring to successful meds to control symptoms and better care in the community. The advent of more advanced imaging techniques, cleaner meds combined with stem cell research may eventually allow us to better treat and hopefully cure mental illness.
In fact, the, the new frontier for mental illness, in fact, all of illness, is not in medications. It's in genetics. They are going to find the genes. It's not going to be one gene. They're going to find the genes that cause schizophrenia, that cause depression, that cause addiction. And they're going to be able to replace that gene with a working copy of that gene. In fact, about five or six years ago, I gave this lecture again to the RNs at, on Ammerman campus. And a student brought in an article where there was a six-year-old girl that had leukemia. They had identified at this point what genes were defective. Leukemia is a form of cancer, blood cancer. They took a denatured HIV virus, meaning denatured, meaning it couldn't cause AIDS. They put the good gene onto the virus, because that's what viruses do, by the way. They take a little DNA. The virus goes into the DNA of the cell, takes a little DNA out of that cell, and, and injects a little DNA into that cell to make that cell now produce more viral particles. Okay. Well, they took a denatured HIV virus. They attached the a good copy of the gene that she didn't that was not working right in her body. The virus went in, injected the right gene into the cell, and cured her leukemia. This is the future of medicine. It's going to be at a genetic level. Okay, what do we have next? Hopefully, we're done because I'm getting tired of talking. Okay, I realize this lecture was quite long. Please review chapter two. Please feel free to email me any questions you have. I will, when class starts, I will be uh, have office hours on Monday from 1 until 3, uh, on Wednesday 1 until 3. I'll also be on and off the computer during those days also. Uh, I will be in clinical on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so I won't be available. Uh, my email address is mangin, M-A-N-G-I-N-M, -M, at sunysuffolk.edu. Okay, feel free to email me. Anyway, please study chapter two. Please know what each of those neurotransmitters do, because if you understand the five basic neurotransmitters that I went over, and when I say a medicine elevates such and such a neurotransmitter, you can predict what that medicine does. Okay, again, the first clinical lecture we're going to have is going to be on um, drug addiction, because drug addiction, particularly cocaine, elevates the excitatory neurotransmitters, adrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin too. And we will see when you elevate those neurotransmitters so high, what happens to your heart, heart attack, what happens to your fear, paranoia. Okay, thank you very much. Hang in there, I'll get better at this computer stuff eventually. Bye-bye.